For starters, I'd like to ask everyone to please mute your electronic devices yes. if you uh, have not already done so. My name is Maury Nunes, and I am privileged to act today as moderator for this distinguished panel. I am blessed with this opportunity as an adjunct professor here at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. And I'm also an attorney in private practice, uh, representing primarily privately held companies uh, and nonprofit entities. Uh, when we scheduled this symposium, uh, it turned out that Groundhog Day was the right day for it, and so uh, here we are in the form of the movie Groundhog Day. I guess we'll be repeating everything over and over. Uh, and in accord with the movie Groundhog Day, I guess we'll be repeating everything. <laughs> All right. uh, the first order of business here is to thank uh, Dean Chris Cormish and uh, her assistant Emily Kalish for all of their work, which was quite substantial uh, in helping us put this program together. And our thanks also to Kat Song uh, of the University, who did a great job handling the publicity. We also owe a, a special thanks to the sponsor of our reception, uh, Chesapeake Investments, and we have three representatives, and we all stand for just a moment. Um, from my left to right, uh, Joanna Saw, Daniel Lim, and Benjamin Kim are representatives here. Chesapeake Investments uh, specializes uh, in commodities and derivatives trading, and I can personally attest they do a very good job. I urge you all to visit their website and support our sponsor. Uh, speaking of the program and the panel I am about to present, I also have to mention if you look at the program, there may not be a lot of um, identity between the pictures you see there and the faces you see up here. Uh, I hopefully make a better moderator than I do a uh, digital computer programmer technological guy. Uh, and so many of, the, many of the photos are either squashed or uh, slimmed down. I figured I wouldn't change the ones that are slipped down. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, allow me to introduce our panel, and I'm, I'm going to start uh, on my right, and you'll move that's the audience's left. Uh, first of all, uh, is Barnes Lawson Esquire. He's an attorney who practices locally regulated land use law uh, in Virginia. And Barnes, would you say a word or two about your practice? Uh, thank you very much. Uh... At, uh, for about three years, Maury and I shared offices in Arlington. It's a pleasure, uh, pleasure to be back associated with him in, in this capacity. Uh, I've been practicing law for about 30 years. I specialize in land use. Uh, if you buy a piece of property and you want to use it for something specific, uh, if you come to me, I'll help you through that process. Uh, we've had clients that do uh, uh, urban villages, Pentagon City, Maryfield Town Center. Uh, we have clients that want to uh, uh, that, that come to us and they want to build a high rise. We'll do that. Uh, some people want to open up their business in it. A uh, group of doctors right now that we're assisting. Sometimes clients come to us and they simply want to put an addition on their house, and we'll help them through that also. Uh, recently, there's been a new body of law that has has arisen. And uh, we assist people who receive violation notices, whether zoning or property maintenance or building code or whatever. We assist those people and we file appeals. We, we go to the regulatory bodies and argue their cases. We always try to resolve it if we can. In rare instances, uh, we may end up uh, having to litigate it in court. So that's kind of a quick overview of what we do. If you have a piece of property, we can usually help you through that in Arlington County and Fairfax County. Thanks, Thank Barnes. Uh, to Barnes's left uh, is Dr. Lisa Kaufman, who chairs her own dermatology practice known as Georgetown Dermatology and is thus subject to much local regulation of the business attributes of her practice. Uh, so Lisa, can you please give our audience just a quick idea of uh, how you were, where you were coming from on this uh, being here today? Up to four years ago, I was a professor and chief of dermatology here at Georgetown University uh, at the hospital across the street. And subsequent to that, I went out on my own into private practice. Basically, a well-trained academic, double-boarded in uh, skin disease, dermatology and skin pathology, all of a sudden caught like a deer in headlights, <laughs> trying to navigate uh, 
negotiating leases, build up building permits, uh, many other things that we'll talk about subsequently. Uh, I am the mother of six-year-old twins, so this has taught me how to be nego how to be patient and how to hone my negotiation skills, which has helped me with some of this regulation. <laughs> To my immediate right is uh, Director Eric Friedman, who leads the Montgomery County Office of Consumer Protection uh, that regulates business uh, relative to consumer matters uh, in that local Maryland jurisdiction. And Eric, can you tell us a little bit about your agency, please? Sure. Let me just very quickly say, if anyone ever has a consumer protection question or problem in Montgomery County, please be sure to contact our agency. And if you say that you attended the symposium, We'll make sure you get expedited service. <laughs> if you have a chance later, please pick up one of our brochures. We're a local government consumer protection office. We're a law enforcement agency. We enforce a local consumer protection unfair and deceptive trade practices act. We have the authority to issue subpoenas, civil citations, bring lawsuits, settlement agreements, have uh, whole ministry of hearings. Most of the complaints that we get are in the area of uh, auto sales and repairs, including auto leasing, financing, repossessions, we deal with home construction, home improvement cases, unlicensed contractors, all uh, retail sales and advertising, impound and towing, financial scams, and uh, we're a local government office uh, with dedicated employees there that help serve you. And to my left uh, is the uh, similarly named, but not exactly, Bill Friedman, uh, who is Deputy Chief of the Consumer Affairs Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission. And Bill, can you describe for us what your bureau does with the FCC? Sure. We have the same names but different mothers. Um, I uh, have been active in communications law for about 34 years. Uh, I used to be an all-night disc jockey in Cleveland, which is where you start from the bottom. And uh, I have been working at the FCC. I worked there for about five years, then I was in private practice <coughs> representing people before the FCC for about 20. I came back and I first worked in the Enforcement Bureau, which is enforces our rules, then in the Media Bureau, which regulates primarily cable, satellite, and broadcasting. And for the last year, I've been in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. The Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau develops and implements consumer policies, including those uh, regarding uh, folks with disabilities as well as uh, tribal nations. We also maintain a consumer call center that is uh, available 24-7 by phone and also by internet and also by uh, email, taking complaints from folks around the country, dealing with the companies that we regulate. Uh, we also coordinate activities with state, local, and tribal governments. <coughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, John Maxwell, uh, next to my left, uh, is the CEO of John Marshall Bank, uh, which is subject to and uh, grappling with a great deal of federal regulations, such as that being introduced under the recently passed Dodd-Frank bill. Uh, John, will you give us the skinny on John Marshall Bank? Glad to. Um, <clears throat> again, John Maxwell. Uh, I've been in banking a little over 30 years. In fact, 30 years ago, I started as a janitor of a bank. And uh, after the last five years, I may very well end my career as a janitor. I've <laughs> <laughs> come full cycle. And, uh, actually, I'm here today mainly to do whatever, whatever Eric Friedman wants me to do um, with our branches in Montgomery County. But uh, John Marshall Bank is a bank that was opened back in 2006. Um, we, uh, my background is that I had started another bank prior to that in 1998 called Case Monroe Bank. We sold that bank in 2008 to a, another larger bank in the area. We put a group of investors together and effectuated a change of control of a small community bank that had started in 2006, renamed it 2008 to John Marshall, and have grown into uh, a little over 400 million in assets. Um, we've just been recognized as the second fastest growing bank in the United States and one of the most profitable banks in the United States. Um, we provide our primary focus uh, is everything that a community bank does, and that's work with relationships with borrowers and depositors, but we focus and have a specialty in commercial real estate finance, small business finance, government contract lending, uh, and cash management services. And we have uh, five locations uh, throughout the metropolitan area. Thanks very much, John. And last but not least is Sandy Saunders, who is a co-managing shareholder at Greenberg Troig, a law firm uh, that is headquartered out of Miami but has a very substantial office here in D.C. and other offices throughout the country. 
Sandy's practice has much focus in energy and pipeline regulation, which also invokes and involves an international dimension. So Sandy, can you give us a quick overview on your practice, please? Sure, uh, I represent energy, vertically integrated energy companies primarily in the midstream, which is the pipeline, the transportation aspect. It's a heavily regulated industry. Most people don't even know it's around until one of them fails. Uh, and then there's a problem. They're regulated on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, both as to the rates they charge, of course, the side of the business I, I don't get involved in. I get involved more on the practical side on the operations. Uh, so they're left with being regulated on, you know, on a regular basis, audited, et cetera. And then also, there's an enforcement component uh, as the agencies uh, have their enforcement authority over the pipeline. So one day you see your, your regulator as, as more as how this up as your partner who's talking to you about your rates and how you stay in business, and the next day uh, they're banging away on you, uh, potentially putting you out of business, and looking at you as these days a revenue stream for the Treasury uh, through their capacity to finance. Thanks, Andy. So, uh, as you can see, on one side of the moderator, we have uh, a local group, and not only local, but representing all three metro jurisdictions, uh, Lawrence from Virginia, uh, Lisa Kaufman from D.C., and Eric Friedman from Maryland. And uh, to my left uh, are folks that are involved primarily in federal regulation, but not only that, John Maxwell's bank is primarily federally regulated as to its regional operations. <coughs> Bill's organization is dealing in national scope, and Sandy's practice uh, involves an international scope. And in fact, uh, he didn't mention it, but I will. Uh, when um, uh, the president of uh, one of the Russian, uh, one of the large Russian oil and gas companies was arrested in, uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, Sandy was the American counsel who was flying back and forth regularly <coughs> to Europe to uh, assist in um, some of the aspects of that, of that case. Uh, our goals here today are basically three. One, we want to tease out the commonalities. What is it about regulation that whether you're trying to get a license for your dog or you're trying to get your airline certificated, what are the common themes? What are some of the do's and don'ts and possibly uh, some of the best practices that uh, apply? And if you do get to the point where the regulator and the uh, regulated are in a standoff, what happens? Uh, you have to fight, does one side have to capitulate? How do you know when you get there? What are the alternatives? So I have high hopes that with this very diverse uh, and conceptually different backgrounds among our, uh, among our panel, that we're going to be able to determine these commonalities and, uh, and get to that point. Those commonalities that we're seeking are the general, uh, but I want to start uh, with the very specific, and on that basis, uh, let me turn to uh, Lisa Kaufman and ask you, Dr. Kaufman, when you were, were establishing your practice, can you describe uh, for our audience and the rest of our panel some of the regulatory, we'll call them challenges, uh, that you faced, and if possible, can you give us an idea of how that affected the costs uh, for the uh, for your practice and still do today? Well, in order to open a medical practice, you need to uh, satisfy many regulatory agencies, starting with simply getting a medical license. Uh, but in order to practice, you don't just need a medical license. You need a national provider ID number. You need a controlled substance number and not just a controlled substance number with the federal government, but a controlled substance number for the state in which you practice. Uh, on top of that, you need to make sure that you have adequate continuing education to consider, <coughs> continue to satisfy the licensing requirements so you maintain your licenses. And then, once you have all your professional numbers, you then move forward to the next step, which is getting numbers for the practice. And that includes tax ID numbers, if you sell as a dermatologist any creams or lotions, uh, sales tax numbers, uh, and then you move forward to the next set of numbers, which are your 
uh, clinical and laboratory licensure numbers. And our practice has the, the physical practice where we see patients in DC, but we have a laboratory where we make slides in Easton, Maryland. Uh, so this required an attorney in DC, namely Maury, plus an attorney in Maryland representing two different PLLCs applying for different sets of billing numbers with different states. I, in, what, in order to have a, a license number for the lab, it's called a CLIA number, you have to fill out a nine-page application. The application has some very straightforward questions or questions that should be straightforward. For example, <coughs> what is the name of your facility? Where is it? And how many specimens do you process a year? The problem with this, though, is in order to have a facility, you have to have signed a lease and presumably started to pay rent. Uh, in order to be processing however many hundreds or thousands of specimens you process, uh, you have to have hired personnel to do this. However, you cannot bill for any of your services unless you have your billing numbers. And you can't have the billing numbers without having your CLIA, which is the Clinical Lab Improvement Amendment number. And this delay can take anywhere between six months to a year for anybody starting out of practice. And it seems that there's no way around this except to have one year of your life where every day you fill out applications and you're calling up different agencies in different states hoping, to, hoping against hope that their monthly meeting for your application will be at least the week before the monthly application for the next step of the next process that you're trying to do. Let me hold you there, Lisa, if I may. Um, it gives us a pretty good idea of some of the challenges. I'm sure you could probably go a couple hours on this because I don't remember what it was like. John, let me turn to you on the federal side. And uh, with the past couple of years, um, uh, everybody's aware that the banking industry has been in some degree of uh, call and excitement. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, on the federal side, uh, what kinds of regulatory challenges you faced and the bank has faced? Um, <clears throat> banking has always been a very heavy, heavily regulated industry. In fact, it's one of the most heavily regulated in this country. Um, I've started two banks, essentially. The first one was uh, back in 1998. And at that point in time, uh, there are two types of banking charters. One is a national charter and one is a state charter. And whichever charter you choose determines your primary group of regulators, either the OCC and the FDIC, or the Federal Reserve, the State Banking Authority, and the uh, FDIC. The application process back then was essentially three separate applications, each one about 200 pages, with basically asking the same questions in a different format. And the process took about four months for approval. Fast forward to John Marshall days when uh, we were looking at starting a bank in 2008. That process remained the same in terms of the application. However, the time frame had been extended to a maximum of four months to 12 to 18 months. There is, uh, because of the change in the economy uh, and the general concern about banking, <coughs> the regulators took a very conservative approach to uh, allowing any new charters at all and basically put up a barrier to entry. There are many stories out there of bankers who went to start a bank, raise their capital, and then after 18 months, didn't get an answer, yes or no, but basically said, we'll let you know someday. Um, so it has become quite a different world in banking, and the barrier of entry has gotten much higher. From a regulatory standpoint, I run a community bank. Um, that's hard for most people to uh, distinguish as to what that is, but basically it's a bank that is headquartered in the region or community that it primarily serves. And typically, today's world has assets of less than a billion dollars. Um, we are very, very heavy, regu heavily regulated. Dodd-Frank is the newest representation out there uh, that has now gone into law, and it will add a significant amount of regulation to the banking world in general. 
but the cost will be borne uh, primarily will come into the community banking realm. Most of the bigger banks are able to pass those costs along with the consumers because of their heavy, heavy emphasis on fee income generation. It's very easy to differentiate that, add fee income or add fee income sources to their portfolio and then raise costs. <coughs> community banks don't have that luxury. Most large banks like B of A will take 30 to 40% of their income in fees. Most community banks, like John Marshall, typically get less than 5% of their income in fees, depending upon spread income, the difference between what we pay on our deposits and earn on our investments and loans as their primary source of income. So more regulation directly affects the bottom lines of community banks. Um, Dodd-Frank is about 2,300 pages of regulation. We're expected to get about 250 new regulations out of it. The good news is that it will uh, make the entire financial world better, mainly because it will start to regulate more frequently and more stringently the non-bank entities, the mortgage companies that are not part of a bank holding company, the payday lenders, the private lenders, the private education lenders, the folks out there who really fly beneath the radar screen of the federal regulatory agencies. And a lot of what has happened in the last five years was because of abuses within those systems. Uh, I'm not giving the big banks, putting them off the hook, because when you're securitizing subprime mortgages and you compromise your underwriting standards, there's a lot of uh, blame to, to bear there as well. However, in the community banking world, most of the community banks play by the rules and were not a part of the uh, downturn, but instead suffered because of it. So the regulatory burden is substantial. It has increased dramatically um, in terms of cost. In my little bank, uh, my bottom line is about $2.8 million last year. Um, $500,000 was purely for regulatory costs, direct and indirect. Um, the banking industry has estimated that uh, Dodd-Frank will cost the banking industry at least 10 to $20 million over the next five years in terms of implementation. In fact, all of, all of uh, regulatory cost or compliance costs in banking in 2010 was estimated at about $26 billion. In 2012, it will be somewhere around $32 billion. So there will be about a 22% increase in costs just from Dodd-Frank alone. Okay, so I, I think uh, what I take out of these two discussions uh, are what we might describe as three different problems that have been, that have been surfaced so far. One of those problems uh, is the notion of ambiguous requirements, uh, as uh, Lisa indicated, where you got questions that, how do you answer these questions, there's a catch-22, chicken and egg, or the questions just can be interpreted in more than one way. Second issue, which seems to be the overriding most powerful issue, is the issue of delay from the regulatory side in terms of just waiting to get an answer uh, when you're trying to comply with the law. And the third issue is this multiplicity of regulations rather than for a particular type of activity or a particular type of business being able to go to what might be sort of a one-stop shop where you could deal with everything at one time uh, in one place. So let me turn to our regulators here. Let me go to the federal side first. And Bill, let me ask, uh, is there a way for government or has government looked at this issue of the impact of delay uh, on the people that regulates and um, what's, the, what's the conclusion? Well, government has looked at all of the problems, all of these problems in terms of the burdens that our regulation places on businesses and the other folks that we regulate. Um, our rules come primarily from statutes that are enacted by Congress uh, in response to some desired public good. And usually what happens is the way uh, an FCC rule or a, or a federal government rule is created is that we run what's known as a rulemaking proceeding. That uh, there's something called the Administrative Procedure Act requires that we provide public notice of what kind of rules we're going to uh, consider adopting and then allows all interested parties the opportunity to come in and comment on them. Um, last year, President Obama issued a couple of executive orders uh, that called on uh, federal agencies, <coughs> including uh, the FCC, to take a hard look at the cost and benefit of any rule that we're trying, that we're considering adopting. And a, a great part of this rulemaking proceeding 
is getting input from the industries and the individuals that we're going to be regulating to find out whether the benefits to the public outweigh the costs to the folks that we're regulating. The second thing that these executive orders required uh, federal agencies, again like the FCC to do, is take a retrospective, hard look at all the rules that are on the books. The FCC in particular is, our regulation is driven by ever-changing technology. And <coughs> industries change, the technology changes, and what we try to do consistently is remain abreast with those changes in technology. For example, you know, one of the major areas that we regulate, and we're regulating when I came into the FCC 30 years ago, was broadcasting. And it has substantially changed with the development of satellite and cable and the uh, preeminence of the internet. And we have to change our rules to keep pace with these technological changes so that we don't overburden industries. So another thing that these executive orders did was, again, require us to take a hard look at all of our rules. And what we're doing is, and all federal agencies are doing this, we're looking at our rules and asking these questions. Has the rule been affected by changes in technology, new scientific research, or changes in the market structure? Is there a disproportionate or undue burden on particular entities resulting in unintended negative consequences? And has the rule been subject to frequent requests for waiver? As a result of this process, which really started in the middle of last year, we've already done away with 190 rules. And each of our bureaus and offices is actively taking, again, a hard look at those rules to see which ones could either be eliminated or revised to, again, lessen the burdens on the folks that we regulate. No offense. But, uh, uh -oh. I'm worried that that doesn't quite answer the question. It's not an issue, uh, that goes to the multiplicity issue, uh -huh. it does. But it doesn't deal with the delay issue, which is in a sense a personal issue or an organizational issue in terms of how uh, a regulatory agency might be structured, how much personnel, manpower there is available, and what the efficiency and the willingness of that manpower is to, to be responsive to uh, those that are regulated, which I think is part of the argument that Lisa has, and John, I think that's part of the argument you've had as well, part of the complaint as well. Um, is there anything being done that you're aware of about that? It's a personnel kind of issue. Yes, there are. There is a continuing monitoring of the backlogs of applications and petitions and requests that are before every part of the FCC dealing with the agency that I'm most familiar with, where we continually monitor what the backlogs are with the idea of taking care of the things that are older and also increasing and speeding up the process of reviewing applications that come in. And as a part of that backlog review, we're constantly looking at our allocation of personnel to find where folks could be uh, put to eliminate that backlog and hopefully eliminate delay. Let me turn to our other regulator here and ask you uh, to comment on the same, particularly on this delay issue and that lack of responsiveness. Sure, you know, when you listen to Lisa's story and John's story, it's, it's understandable that government regulation can be considered burdensome. But it certainly is not evil because the motivation for this regulation is to protect us, to protect all of us as consumers. So when we, we go to Lisa's office and her lab results come back and it says we don't have skin cancer, we want to have some assurance that the lab is going by proper methods and that we can trust the information. And by the same token, when we go to John's bank, we want to make sure we're not getting a toxic predatory loan that's going to blow up in a few years and we're going to be uh, losing our home to foreclosure. So the, the motivation is to protect consumers. Quick example, in Montgomery County, we license new home builders. So yes, the, the, the New Home Builders Board meets once a month, first Tuesday of the month. And the timing may mean that you have to wait a whole month before you can get a license as a new home builder in Montgomery County. But the balance there on the other end is that a consumer in Montgomery County <coughs> is going to be paying several hundred thousand dollars in a deposit. And they want to have some assurance that you know how to build a house and it's going to be built properly. Uh, that's not going to have huge construction deficiencies. And you may have a consumer with many years worth of problems and frustrations because an unlicensed builder 
or an incompetent bogus may have constructed a home and walked away from the settlement table. So it's clearly there can be delays. And in an economy, when government regulators are having their budgets cut and the cumulative effect of having sh uh, short staff, there can be delays there. But again, it's a balancing act, not designed to be evil, but designed there to protect us as consumers. So uh, one of the things I take from this is, is that um, the responsibilities of the agencies and just the vicissitudes of life, budgets, et cetera, the constraints uh, have an impact. But first, let me turn to uh, our two attorneys here. Barnes, uh, if you had a client that came to you and uh, they can't get an answer out of the regulatory authority, uh, is there advice you would give them or action you would take? Well, uh, more a couple of thoughts. I, I jotted down a couple of thoughts as I listened to this. What Arlington has done is we have, uh, uh, when someone goes and applies for a business license, they'll assign an individual to that business and they will walk them throughout the county. They'll take them to zoning, they'll take them everywhere they need to go in order to get permissions to open up the business. And it's become a lot more effective in Arlington uh, with that. Um, a second thing uh, that has happened is if I file for a rezoning uh, in Virginia, we have a state code that requires a, a decision within a year. If, if I require, uh, if I file for a special exception, I have to get an answer in four months. If it's a variance, it has to be in, in two months. So I think that often we can, we can go to the legislature and set time limits by which a response has to come. Uh, if you can't get an answer, uh, all you can really do is, is go to the person who's supposed to make the decision, and if you don't get uh, an answer from there, then you just need to climb the ladder as you would in any other interaction with an entity. Thanks, Bart. Sam, you want to throw anything to that? <coughs> well, the, the, for, for some of my clients that deal with regulations, there are times they like certain regulation. I mean, for certain industries, it helps to set a standard, and if you have if you have cowboys in the industry and they're going to go and cut corners and they're going to be problems, that's a problem for the entire industry. Next time if you want to go and build a new pipeline, et cetera, if there's been a failure a couple miles down the road, that's a problem. But at the same time, the proliferation of the regulations can, can paralyze your business. And if you're being required to take certain actions that, that just don't have any practical application, you can burn off funds where it can significantly raise your costs. And then there's a the question, how do you stay in the industry? What does it do to your price structure, which makes your clients, you know, which makes your clients unhappy, and then flips around and, and makes it more difficult to do business. Uh, we have, I mean, I see with clients, I mean, one example, you know, clients have turned away from doing business because the regulations just reach a certain point. It goes more to what you're talking, people talking about Dodd Frank and Sorbet's Oxen before it. The, the great, you know, yes, it was designed to address certain problems, but I, I know of at least two businesses that have turned away from the United States from bringing their businesses here because the cost in, that they look at in administration and accounting and oversight to, to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley and now with some of the <coughs> Frank, they can go to London with London's real estate prices and function more efficiently and less expensively. And so we can have clients... They're gone. They're, I, I can't argue with them. No, no, I'm, 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 I hear you. But if you had clients that were coming here and faced this kind of delay, such as John or Lisa described, is there advice you give your client about how to deal with that delay, anything more than what we've heard from Barnes? No. Okay. Not enough on the industry side. Okay. All right. Not on the industry side.